Welcome to the Transitioning from Fellowship to Faculty, Tips and Tricks from the Experts, Day One webinar. Today's session is the first of two webinars on career development and will cover job search through interviews, followed by a gallery Q&A discussion. This session is developed by the AST Trainee and Young Faculty Community of Practice and is proudly supported by the AST Fellows Planning Committee and the AST Education Committee. AST would like to take a special moment to thank all of the fellows 2022 attendees, as well as all current and future TYFCOP members in our audience today. And now, it is my pleasure to turn the session over to our moderators, Dr. Farouk and Lair, to begin our presentation. Uh, thanks, Brian, um, and welcome everyone to this webinar that we're very excited about uh, titled Transitioning from Fellowship to Faculty, Tips and Tricks from the Expert. Uh, we're really looking forward to a, a four outstanding panelists who will be covering topics that are really important for this uh, almost a fragile time for transitioning from fellowship to faculty. And so we'll be hearing from our experts about uh, looking for jobs, uh, making connections and expanding job horizons, how to stand out on your CV, and finally virtual interview tips. Uh, and so on behalf of the TYFCOP, welcome to the session and we'll turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Katz Greenberg. Thank you, Dr. Farouk, and thank you everyone for inviting me. It's my honor to be here and to be the first presenter. My name is Goni Katz Greenberg. I'm currently uh, in my third year of faculty here at Duke University in Durham. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank the organizer for this opportunity. So first and foremost, I have no financial uh, relationship or anything else to declare um, as it pertains to this talk. We are here today to discuss when and how one should look for their first out of fellowship job with some tips that hopefully will help you with this job search, which can be intimidating and scary as this might be your first real job out of school actually. So before we go into the weeds of everything, let's remember why we are here. You did it. You completed college, you completed medical school, you completed residency, and now you're either completed one or almost two fellowship, depending on where you are and if you went into the sub subspecialty. And it's time to look for your dream job. Remember when you go through this process, all that you have done to reach here and be try to get excited as well as some nervousness is allowed with what uh, what is to come. So the first part of my talk will focus on when. When is a good time to start looking for your first job? So the short answer, as not if we are not going to be proscenators, is now. So I could tell you that this is the gist of my talk, and we'll go to the other presenter, but not yet. So I know that we're all taught and know that we shouldn't leave anything to the last minute. This is not a one-word answer. So some things should be done now or as soon as you can or as soon as you're able, but there are things when looking for a job that can probably wait a little or take some more time as you move towards the time that you're actually going to start a job. So let's go into some things that one might want to consider when they're looking for their first job of when to start looking. So if you ask a group of professional docs, healthcare providers, whatever, um, when to start looking, there's no right answer. There's no one answer. Some will tell you start now. Some will tell you start a couple of years before you're thinking about your new job, which might be realistic or not. And some can, will tell you you can wait till the last minute when uh, the job that you want is, is published or publicized somewhere and, and go from there. I think there are a few things to consider when thinking about this. First of all, the length of fellowship. So if this audience is consistent of people who have done their fellowship of some kind of specialty, like let's say cardiology or pediatrics or uh, nephrology, and then go on to do their subspecialty in transplant, depending on how long your transplant nephrology is. So most Places I think have now shortened the transplant fellowship to about a year. Some have a two year, depending on research. So if you want more than a year to start looking for your job, you might want to do it in your subspecialty uh, fellowship and not the sub subspecialty fellowship. So think about how long the fellowship you're at now. The second thing is what 
are your limitations. Maybe there's only one place in the United States that you can have a job because of personal reasons, because of other reasons. If there's only one state or one city that you want or are able to get a job at for different reasons, I would start earlier because you'll have less flexibility of where you go. The other thing that you should look should know that some employers do have a two year or three year or four year plan, and they might uh, put out the, a word for, to some people that they're looking, um, but not for now, not for next year, but for two years for now, for three years from now. So you might miss this, miss this, sorry, miss these opportunities if you start looking too late. So these are all things that to consider when thinking about when to start looking. So I think a good rule of thumb is ideally to start prepping a year or two in advance. So let's say right now we're in the fall of 2022 and you're thinking about 2024, July 2024 is when you're going to start your first job. This is the time to start prepping. And maybe in about a year from now is when you'll actually start applying for a job. Now, even if you're at the end of your fellowship and you're going to go to your merry way and on July of 2023, don't fret. I've had numerous colleagues and friends who either didn't start till now or with, with nothing done before or actually got a job and knew where they were going, but for some different reasons, family, faculty, um, COVID um, changed, couldn't go where they were supposed to go, ended up searching for a new place at the last minute. And I can tell you that they're all, the people that I can think about are now in a good job that they wanted with no gaps. So most jobs you can probably get from application to getting started or getting the, um, or, or getting the, the contract within three or four months. Now, the next part is how to start looking for a job. So thinking about your possibilities, you might feel overwhelmed, overworked, you're still busy and in fellowship, which doesn't give you a lot of free time. So there's a lot to think about, a lot to consider when you do it. So first thing is take a deep breath and relax. Remember that you're now going to complete your training and you're now going to embark on the next chapter in your life and your career. And this is something where somewhere that you wanted to be. This is why all the hard work and all the years went into. So how do we start looking after we're relaxing? The first thing I think one should do is do a little bit of soul searching. So there are a million types of jobs out there and it can be overwhelming when you don't know exactly what you want. So take some time to think with yourself and your family what type of job do you want? Do you want an academic job? Do you want a private practice job? Are you thinking about a hybrid? Do you want to do more administration? Do you want to do more teaching? Do you want to do more research? So if you want to do more research, maybe go to a place that it has full research um, portfolio versus somewhere that you know that people don't do as much research there. What did you do during your fellowship? Were you in a research in a research fellowship, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to continue with research if you decided you don't want to, but take a moment to think what kind of job you're looking for. Then consider, or maybe first consider, what you and your family are able to do or what you want to do. Do you have a partner? Do you have a spouse? Do you have children? Maybe you and your girlfriend or boyfriend spent the last three or four years of your training and long distance relationship. So now is the time to go back to the town where where you first met or where he or she lives. Maybe you want to be closer to your parents or their parents for support for their kids. Maybe the cost of living is too high in New York or Chicago and you need to, to look elsewhere because you have four children to feed. So again, taking all these things under, un, under consideration to think about what kind of job you want. Now, you don't have to have all the answer when you complete a soul searching, but maybe an outline of what kind of job you think you'd want for the next three to six years. So once you have that, the next step is to prepare and update your CV. I'm not going to go into that because that's our third talk of the day. But after you get your um, kind of soul searching and mindset of what kind of job you want, think about how to frame your CV to, to, to make you the most, um, to, to be the most appropriate for your job. And then get a feel of what's out there. Now, there are a lot of resources uh, available. First of all, every 
every organ specific or every specialty has their society and they usually will have an excellent resource for what kind of jobs are there. I know there's some in the ASN, American Society of Nephrology, and I know there's some in the liver world and I'm sure that's true for pediatrics, for pharmacy, for ID. AST has an excellent career center uh, which you can look, and I looked a couple of days ago while preparing this talk, and it gives you a list of all the jobs that are out there. And through Twitter, there's a lot of uh, times that it will say that there's a new job posting. So use that. Look at what's out there. Look at what area. Look at what the question is. And of course, the last thing which is important is the word to mouth. But how will you hear about the word to mouth? So the next step I think one should do when looking for a job is to assemble your team. You have to think who will be the best to help you get the job that you want. First and foremost is your program director. They're there to help you. They usually will be more senior to you and have a lot of connection within the transplant world and will be able to introduce you to people and know about job opportunities. So you should have and add them to your speed dial and they should have you on their speed dial with any opportunity. Of course, after you do your soul searching, you should probably go back to them and tell them, this is the kind of job I want. This is what I'm looking for. So they'll know when to um, reach out to you when they hear about an opportunity. The next part of your team are your mentors. So either past or current, you all did your residency elsewhere. You all went to school elsewhere. Maybe there's someone there who you're still are able to connect. Maybe you want to go back to that institution. So always contact them. If you don't ask or if you don't call or if you don't write, the answer is always no. So try to get the word out there to whoever has been in contact with you in the, uh, before. The last member of your team is us. So the young faculty. We are there. We went through what you're going now two or three years ago. We probably have the most sense of what the job uh, market is in now. And I know personally, I'm happy to help and happy to ask any, happy to answer any questions that our fellows have. But also remember that maybe I took a job now and I know that there's an opening for a year or a year or two years from now that I couldn't wait for, but I can tell you about it and you can then go and, um, and apply for that. So now that you have your team and you have what kind of job you, um, you want, what do you do next? So the next thing is not a surprise, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more, is network. Network through whatever you can find. So any opportunity to meet people or to talk to people, take it. Whether it's through social media, Twitter is a great resource. It also is a great resource for the uh, trainee and young faculty, COP, but also conferences. So there's, of course, the discipline-specific conferences and then the transplant conferences like the American Society of Transplant. And then, I'm sorry, the American Transplant Congress. And then not to forget the fellow symposium, which has been in every one of my slides. So when I went to the, to the, the, the fellow symposium a few years back, I remember having breakfast and suddenly Dr. Emily Blumberg sat down next to me. And during lunch, Dr. Rosling Menon sat down next to me and talked. And they're there to help us. That's part of the wonderful thing the fellow symposium has become. So use it, go whenever you can. And remember, these are your opportunities. And again, lastly, the COP, the community of practice, there are many community of practices within the AST and uh, try to connect. Um, I know that personally, I've made wonderful connection through there, which has helped me through my job search. Now is the money time. So you make sure your CV is up to date, you write a cover letter and you apply to the job of your dream or to several job of your dream. Now, before, you get the job, I just want to give another different kind of advice of what I call a cautionary tale. Although you're under no obligation to tell anyone what you want or anyone outside of your circle of where you want to go or what you want to do, I would advise you to be as transparent as you feel comfortable with. So if there are five places that you're looking or hoping to, to apply to, or applied to already, you can tell any one of those places, I'm also interviewing it for other places. If you change courses and you, you want you decided that you don't want research in your life, tell your research uh, mentor that you're seeking a non-research faculty appointment. If you decided that you don't want to stay in your institution and your program director was sure that you're staying there, tell them that you are looking elsewhere. So don't let your team or your mentors find out another way. Remember the transplant community is still a very small community and you don't want to burn any bridges. 
So to sum up, start early, as early as you can. Assemble your team. Network, network, network. And even if you don't start the actual um, job hunting or actual preparing your CV or your cover letter, just make sure that you do start networking with anything that you um, have, um, like society conferences, et cetera, et cetera. Always ask about opportunities. Remember, if you don't ask, the answer will be no. And then at the end of the day, nothing is forever. So even if you find what you think is a dream job and your situation change or everyone there is not who you thought they are, and at the end of the day, you can get up and look for another job, even if it's after two years where you thought you'll stay there for your whole career, or if it's never, maybe you stayed in one institution. I can tell you that I had a long uh, um, job search on my own. I knew that I wanted to leave my, my institution where I trained because I wanted to make a change. And because some people told me that if you stay at the same institution when you did your fellowship, you'll always be the fellow. So some institution, I think it's true. Some institution is probably not true, but I chose to go to somewhere that I know does a lot of research, which is what I want my career to look like. And anyone um, can do it with just a little bit of planning. Uh, and lastly, just relax, have fun, and enjoy the fact that you are now looking for your first job after a fellowship. Thank you. And please feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to answer any questions. And I think now um, next, uh, next talk will be by Howard. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Howard Lee, and it is really my pleasure today to be here to share with you about uh, the second part of our webinar today, how to leverage national meetings to make connection and expand job horizons. I'm currently assistant professor of medicine and surgery in Baylor College of Medicine, and here's my contact. Um, and again, I want to thank you for the organizing committee and AST to have this webinar and invite me as one of the speaker, and I, have, I don't have any financial disclosure. So, during the first talk, we learned a lot about you know when to start, and now I'm giving a little bit about uh, more specific uh, tips for uh, uh, using national conference. Uh, so we all know that uh, you know during the national conference, so there's a lot of things we can do. The first important thing that was emphasized already in our first talk is networking. Also, I think that the conference is especially for for trainees or uh, junior faculty, that's the place that we can start building our reputation, present our studies, uh, et cetera. Also, this is also a place for learning new ideas, you know, you're knowing the training you feel and getting inspired. And last but not least, you know, it's also a great place to, to help us to find a job. Um, so how can the national conference really help finding a job? First, you know, this is a time that a lot of people in your field will show up in the, the same place. Now with the COVID pandemic is, you know, um, we're till the end of it. So, you know, everything opens up. So it's a great timing that you can schedule interviews for the program that you already reach out to. Also, you know, it's also a good timing, especially if you are still early on your game and you can reach out to the new institution and start doing some networking and talk to them about, is there any job opportunity for the next year or two? and what this job going to be look like. The third is, you know, you can uh, get in inside information about potential job opportunities um, during the networking process, like uh, our first presenter saying about, you know, uh, that you, uh, Goni said about, you can, you can hear about potential job only in the future and what the job is going to look like. Uh, also, it's a stage to show yourself and, you know, the right job might actually come find you. Um, so, you know, and those concepts are all, you know, pretty straightforward, but how do you do it? Well, how should you do it in the national conference to increase the, the chance of finding a job? So I'm going to break it down to three parts that I'm going to recommend. First, before the meeting, I think the first one, you, you need to set your goals. Like, it also depends on when, uh, like Goni said in the first talk, like, you know, what is your, what, where are you at your timing? Is this kind of the last national conference you have for the job season or right before you graduate or is you're still early on like you, as your junior faculty, uh, junior fellow? So um, you should set up your goals. Are you thinking about schedule, 
plenty of interviews or this is a job that this is the time that you will just start exploring. So also I would recommend to read the whole program. Um, actually, uh, this is an example for ATC 2022. So, you know, what I did is actually going to each program and kind of highlighting, oh, this, this, might, this talk might be interesting. Also thinking about, oh, this institution, you know, have done a lot of work that I'm interested in, you know, maybe I should go listen to the talk and see if there's a chance I can talk to the faculty or a fellow there and, and, and reach out. Um, and the other thing when you do uh, when you do before the meeting, I would encourage them if you identify the program and the person, you can reach out to them and then and you know uh, set out a brief uh, you know having a coffee together or or even a dinner lunch together. And the other thing I would recommend you doing is actually send out calendar invites in advance so they can have that on their calendar so they won't forget. And lastly, you know, the other thing I would encourage you to do is join the special interest group and, and trainee group. Um, like there's a lot of different cops in the uh, in the AST. So I encourage you to join the one that, that, you know, makes sense to you that you are interested. And a lot of times during that you have, you can increase your networking and, uh, during the conference, even before, after the conference. And Last one is, uh, I think that's one of the tips as also, you know, I think it's, it's important is, you know, if you can stay at one of the official hotels or, you know, sometimes I know it can be, uh, it can be the more expensive hotel. So, you know, you, uh, but I, I think the idea is to stay as close as possible. So it's easier for you to, to go back and forth. And also if you stay one of the official hotels, you might have increased your time, uh, chance to networking with other people that in the conference. So I think that's also a helpful tip. And the other thing is, uh, you know, when talking about looking for sessions that you should not miss during the conference. So I think, you know, uh, uh, the good, a good concept to think about is actually uh, a lot of times we go for the big lectures in the lecture hall to learn fancy stuff. But from a job searching perspective, it's actually very helpful to join the smaller session too, such as maybe the expert session or some group, uh, small group discussion. Because, you know, during that time, you have a little bit more focused group and a little bit smaller um, amount of people that it's actually easier for networking and ask questions, etc. Also, I do, I want to call your attention on the poster sessions. I know you know a lot of times the poster presentation might not be as exciting uh, compared to the uh, compared to the uh, you know the big lectures, but. You know, poster station is also a good timing that you can work around and meet people and then, you know, in the more relaxed uh, condition. So I think it's also a good timing for networking and potentially finding a job. Uh, the next is a lot of conferences and now I know they have the young career and trainee launches that, you know, those are the place that a lot of uh, earlier career people that hand out. I think that's also a good place that you can show up and just do some networking there. Lastly is the social event. Uh, many conferences have uh, different receptions for a different group of people or even a big uh, reception for all the attendees. I will recommend you to uh, also uh, join those uh, social events, uh, again, to increase your networking opportunities as well. So the other thing during the meeting is I will recommend you uh, prepare a one to three minutes version of self-introduction. You're going to do that a lot uh, in your uh, in the meetings. Also, you know, if you are really um, thinking about finding a job, you should see how are you going to put that in your uh, self-introduction so people kind of remember that. Uh, also, you know, um, nowadays uh, we don't use business card that much, uh, but, you know, I think it's still for some uh, for some um, people, that's probably still a good way for them to remember you and, you know, have your contact number, uh, contact email, et cetera. Also, uh, I would recommend you uh, showing up early uh, of the session. So a lot of times, you know, the presenter will be there earlier and you might have a chance to, you know, you might have a chance to interact with them or you, you might have a chance to interact with some other audience that came earlier. Uh, so just increasing their working opportunities. Also, uh, you know, asking good questions is a good way to uh, impress people and they, they can, you know, uh, that will, I think that will also help. Lastly, I think, it, you know, you should really use your time really wisely at the, uh, at the meeting. Um, I know nowadays a lot of conferences are very exciting locations. You might, you might never been to that city before. You might want to do sightseeing. Uh, I will actually uh, 
I do not recommend that because you know a lot of times, um, um, it, especially if you are really want to find a job, you know, uh, I will recommend you uh, instead of doing a lot of side things uh, during the conference, stay a day or two extra to explore the city. So you should focus on your conference time in the networking and you know contact people, etc. Also, you know, uh, the lobby of the hotel or the conference hall or the uh, cafeteria of the um, of the com uh, of the conference venue a lot of times you will, you'll find a good uh, networking opportunities as well lastly we're talking about after the meeting and this this step is open neglected uh, I, I think you know it's but it's I think it's very very important because you know during the meeting everyone is busy um, you know the faculty the, the program you're interested they might talk to uh, you know, 30, 40 of people during the conference. So I think it's important to follow up. And, you know, uh, usually I like to send an a, a email out around a week afterwards, because, you know, usually the first week back, a lot of people still busy catching up on their inbox and stuff like that. So I, I, in my opinion, I think around a week will be a good time to kind of remind you about yourself and get uh, focus on the positive things and common ground that you guys talk about during the meeting. And then you can even schedule another virtual interview or a phone call to follow up. Um, so, um, and the people, the people that knows me knows I've spent probably way too much time on social media, especially Twitter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about using social media at a conference. So, you know, before the meeting, I think what you can do is make sure you have a update professional profile on your Twitter. So, you know, when people meet you and they want to search you on social media, you have updated one. Like this is my Twitter profile kind of show. What, where I'm right now, what my interest is, where my prior training is. So you should have something like that setting up. It's not, uh, uh, you know, it, no matter it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or other social media platform. Uh, and then the other thing I found out, uh, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Stan, and then and he did this one for the upcoming uh, liver meeting. So I think it's a great uh, example as well. What he did is he consolidate all his present, uh, presentation of the meeting at one slide and tweet it. I think that's also give uh, you know people a very good impression and kind of a kind of really good picture about your uh, about your career and your interest. During the meeting, of course, tweet about the uh, your own presentation and others presentation that you're interested. And in. uh, using social media during the meeting also help you uh, find out that there might be some important topic that you might missing, etc. After the meeting, you can also tweet about your what you have learned. And then during the meeting, and that can also um, that can also come, you know keep continue the networking effect from the conference. So I think social media is a really good tool when you go to the conference as well. This is my take home slide. So just a quick summary. So you know I you know uh, before the meeting, uh, you should be prepared, set up your goal, identify institution and person that we like to reach out, identify the session that you would like to attend. Uh, during the meeting, you should be on time, which is uh, including set a calendar alarm. Again, everyone's busy, so uh, invite, uh, invite with a calendar invite might be uh, very helpful. You should respect each other's time, be brief and sweet if possible, and use your time wisely. You should attend a small group discussion, an MTE session, and social event if possible. Also use the social media to increase uh, chance for interaction. Lastly, keep in contact after the conference, a so follow-up email. I think will be very, very helpful. So thank you again for joining our talk today. Uh, I'm, I, the, I know the presentation is pretty short, but so if you have any other question that didn't get to ask at the Q&A, feel free to reach out me, uh, reach me out on Twitter or on my email address here. Thank you again for coming. All right, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm a professor of medicine at Smith Heart Institute at Cedar Sinai, so I'm very far out from this process. But don't fear, I'm also the program director for our Heart Failure Transplant Fellowship, so I do have some experience in the transition from fellowship to faculty. And I was asked to talk to you about virtual interview tips. Uh, so first, um, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, but I do have a disclaimer in that many of the things I'm going to tell you when we think about the hierarchy of medical evidence is only based on the opinion of 
expert. So I'll give you my take on the process. And the first thing I'm going to say to echo some of the things you've already heard from my esteemed colleagues and panelists is that you are already great at interviewing. You have been to college, medical school, residency, and fellowship, so you know how to fashion pithy anecdotes about why your specialty is the best and your meaningful clinical experiences and the novel research you're engaged in and your career trajectory. But what I want you to think about is what's the point of an interview? Is it to win friends and influence people? Probably. But are you more on the spectrum of Sally Field at the 1985 Oscars where you just want people to like you? Or are you more of an Olivia Pope in Scandal where you are the hot commodity? And I think when it comes to a job interview, as opposed to a fellowship interview, it's really important to remember that a job interview is bi-directional. It's not just what they want, it's what you want. And when you get the confluence of these two things, you're going to find out if it's the right fit. So look at the job interview as a time to figure out what you want, if they have it, and how do you know that? Well, I'm going to give you my four easy steps of identifying the parameters, prioritizing the parameters, making some lists, and getting the information you need. So the parameters, as Dr. Katz Greenberg really put together so beautifully, was geography, job type, and specialty focus. The intersection is your ideal job, but there's never tech, usually a perfect job. And then you think about the geography, family, child care, a spouse, partner, places that make you happy. For the field of heart failure transplantation, we think about do you want to do more transplant or PH or MCS or shock, and then do you want a totally academic job, a privademic job, or full private practice. Once you do that essential soul searching, then you're going to make some lists. And you're going to put down the names of programs and you're going to rank them. And maybe program A is your ideal job, and you're not sure if they're hiring. And program C is everything you want in a bad location. Program D is the perfect location, but maybe not the specialty focus or job type. And as you do this, you'll refine your list. You'll figure out where you want to seriously reach out to and where you'll ultimately end up interviewing. And when you do interview, the first question is, who should you get the information you need from? And it really doesn't matter if you're virtual or if you're in person, the people you're going to talk to to figure out if the job is the right fit for you are junior and senior faculty, fellows, nurse practitioners, transplant coordinators, administrators, your mentors. These are the people who are going to give you the information you need. And if those are the right people, then the next question is, what are you supposed to ask them? Well, these are my tried and true questions to really get at the culture of the program and how best it might be a fit for you. So the senior faculty, you want to know what's their vision? What's your vision for my role? You also want to know if they've been there for a while or even if they were newly recruited, why did they choose the job or why have they stayed? The junior faculty, you want to get their take on what the greatest need or gap for a new hire is and how does that contrast with what the senior faculty may say? Ask the junior faculty why they chose the job. What's the most challenging aspect of being junior faculty? And get a sense of what their administrative support is like, because that will give you a sense of how junior faculty are valued within the structure of the department. When it comes to the fellows, the nurse practitioners, the coordinators, do they feel they have the appropriate level of responsibility, autonomy, support, or faculty available when needed? Is the program responsive to issues when they arise? Again, you get a sense of the culture through all levels of expertise. For administrators, it's also very interesting to contrast what the administrator's vision for your role might be as compared to junior and senior faculty and what changes are anticipated because administrators often know about them before positions. And then armed with all this information from junior and senior faculty, fellows, NPs, coordinators, administrators, you go to the mentors that know you best, those people that you have relied on as your role models through residency and fellowship and hung on to and communicated with and connected with, and you go through which they think knowing you as they do might be the best fit for you. 
So my take home messages. The job interview is bi-directional. You already know how to impress people or you would not have gotten this far. So know what you want. Identify the parameters, prioritize the parameters, make some lists, and then ask the right questions of the right people to get the information you need. Uh, last but not least, your CV. Well, if you think about it, you can't get a job without having um, a CV. And I'm sure all of you have um, already put together your CV over the years. You had one when you applied for medical school and residency and fellowship. This is really the time to look at it very carefully now that it really needs to be spiffed up for your first job. And um, CVs are very important, but I think um, it's a little bit more of what you want to focus on in your CV rather than putting every single thing down on your CV, which you've probably been used to. Um, I remember I used to be a fellowship director and uh, many CVs still would include things that were like personal hobbies and stuff like that. Those are the things that are probably at this point uh, are appropriate to leave out, which, which I'll mention in a minute. So just, just some major kind of overlying um, things about CVs. It needs to be a logical flow to get the field for your, uh, for your career trajectory. So sort of make it look like a little mini novel uh, um, or autobiography of your, your, yourself and your academic career up until that point. Be really clear and concise and to the point and accurate. Uh, of course, you don't want to stretch the truth on anything that can always come back to haunt you. Even uh, just it's just best to be 100% accurate um, uh, with your CV. And, and I'll talk about fluff at the end that you just kind of want to remove. So ne next slide. Okay, so just start with your essentials, and this you'll probably already have, but you want your basic kind of demographics um, and, uh, you know, your, your training, where you did your, all of your training um, through undergrad, through fellowship, any other degrees, of course, master's degrees, PhDs, um, definitely list your current medical license, your board certifications, um, and this, obviously, some people may have a hospital appointment from some people do gap years where they've had hospital appointments. And, and some people have had academic appointments before. But um, most of the time, if you're looking for your first job, this, that will be left blank. The next slide. OK, so then you're going to want on your CV to really kind of focus in on the areas that you want to highlight. Um, and so. Um, it's fine to leave some of these areas out and you don't have to have a heading with nothing underneath it. But, you know, you want to be talking about some committee memberships, whether it's local at, uh, at your own um, during your training, or maybe you've gotten involved with an AST committee or another committee through a different society. Um, any honors you've, you've um, uh, achieved over time, this can just, you know, usually can go back from undergraduate moving forward awards. Um, and, uh, you know, if you've done any journal work, for instance, if you were um, helping a, uh, an, uh, a reviewer, a, a faculty reviewer with um, a review for, let's say, AJT, you can certainly put that down on your CV. Those are, are nice things to have. Um, any lectures that you've given, um, Research grants that you may have gotten any any time throughout your fellowship, anything is fair game, even if it's you know a five hundred dollar research grant. Anything is is uh, acceptable here. Published papers, I like to break it down into, um, and this is sort of at Northwestern they make us break it down this way. But peer reviewed uh, original research papers are usually in a separate category. Then you've sort of got non peer reviewed um, book chapters, editorials, commentaries. Again, don't feel like you have to fill that if they are uh, blank. Um, then, you know, random things can also be sort of nice to put in there. If you did any kind of web-based work, um, uh, any volunteer work that would be relevant to, um, to the... Uh... 
Well, it looks like we have uh, lost uh, Dr. Levitsky for a second. So I'm going to, uh, unfortunately, uh, we do apologize for the technical difficulties. We're we'll work with uh, Dr. Levitsky to see whether or not his slides, can, we can make his slides available uh, or the notes from his slides available after the presentation. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Drs. Uh, uh, Farouk and Lair to uh, join and uh, we'll stop the presentation. Oh, we have, uh, we have, we have Dr. Levitsky I, back as I well. Apologize. I apologize. apologize. That's okay. Apologize about that. Just finishing up. So, um, uh, you know, any kind of volunteer work, um, if you have any patents, languages spoken, those are kind of nice things. And um, again, trainees is a good idea to put down some professional references um, would be a good idea. Um, you know, give your CV time and attention, check for any mistakes. Um, that can be kind of a killer if you, if you have spelling errors or grammatical errors. Um, if you have to explain any gaps, it's a good idea to put it down rather than explain it later. Um, it's, it's always appropriate to just have a line in there as to why you might have taken a couple of years off. Um, just again, paying attention to detail. There's no real length limit, but really longer CVs aren't better. You really want to just be, be focusing in and on exactly what you've accomplished. And the fluff, I just want to mention things that aren't relevant to your job candidacy. You know, I don't think a photo really is needed. Um, things that are personal information, hobbies, stuff like that. At this point, um, unless it's something really important to your job, probably just leave it out. I want to thank all of our panelists for their excellent discussions and uh, talks for our, fel uh, our fellows looking for faculty positions over the coming years. Um, I want to encourage you, if you have any questions, to submit them through the Q&A. And Samira and I will take a look at these, and we can start um, with questions that we already have in the Q&A. So I'll take the first one, and Samira, if you'd like, you can take the next one. Um, this first question is from a current fellow who has been reaching out to programs um, and they're looking for a way that they can tell programs that they've interviewed with, that they're also speaking with other programs and waiting to hear back. They're worried about the very few openings that appear available for all of the fellows and then they wanted to know if you could provide advice about how many programs they should be contacting and or interviewing with. Um, I'll start, I guess, by giving some insight into how do you politely tell programs you're interviewing at other places. The good news is every program knows you're interviewing at other places. I mean, this is the reality of the situation, the job market. So I think it's reasonable to say in that follow up, because like you're on a time crunch, a match is nice because everyone has a common deadline. The job search is nerve wracking because there is no common deadline. I think a nice thing to do is simply to send an email. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted given this very timeline, if I, please let me know when I could hear back as other programs are also waiting to hear from me. Something as vague as that, you don't have to name the other programs, but it's not gonna be a surprise to them, so you should feel very comfortable with that. Regarding how many programs to apply to, I imagine it probably differs based on what specialty you're in, as well as what geographical preference you have. If you want a certain geographical preference and it's a tight area like Southern California, I tell my fellows, apply everything you can get your hands on, recruiters, job boards, just blanket them. And if it's more of a geographic anywhere, but you have a special job type in mind, then again, you go broadly uh, using the job boards for assistance. I it's hard to put a number on it, but it's something your program director should discuss with you when you're realistic within your specialty, your chosen area, if what, what your wish list is, is realistic. Yeah, I, I will also like to echo that, you know, I, I, you know, and I'm as a faculty, I'm, this is just my second year of faculty. So, you know, I know how that feels. I think it's a little bit different uh, between apply for a fellowship rather than, you know, apply for a job. So in a fellowship, we, we kind of know, oh, you need to have a certain number of interviews that kind of you're kind of safe uh, to get in the fellowship position. But I think it's a little bit different in job, you know, especially for all, I think all the transplant specialty, we are very highly specialized. So, and then I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, and if they are offering a job interview, most likely they are going to be really interested in you. So I think you are most likely getting offer of the place that you are interviewing at. So I don't, you know, compare to the uh, numbers that you have uh, received for application for fellowship, I think the number is 
not as important in terms of job searching. And I, I totally agree uh, with Dr. Kittleson. That's more like, you know, I mean, you should really depends on how restricted, how, how big is your wish list. If you have a huge wish list or very restricted stuff, then you should definitely apply to any program that, you know, that you are, you, you think you should, you, you're willing to go. But if you have, uh, if you have well opening, um, you know, where you don't really have that much restrictions, then, then it's okay to start with the program that, you know, that you will really like to go and kind of, kind of start from there. So. And um, thanks. Uh, so next question uh, may be directed towards Dr. Kittleson about the interview process. Uh, what is the best way to find out about maternity leave policies without having it affect your chances of employment? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, maternity leave policies are pretty much a federal requirement. So I think the policy or no policy is just exists because it's there. Now, but I understand your point. You don't want to go in there saying, how many days of vacation do I get? Do I have to take any call? Because then you don't, you don't have the perception that it, that, it, that it conveys. I would say the administrators, because as you get through that job process, you will be meeting with the HR people, and that's probably you feel most comfortable asking them. But the bottom line is, because these things are essentially mandated, you're not going to have an issue getting the time off you need. Uh, and it's, it's not even necessarily a question for the physicians involved, but more the administrators on the team. Can I just uh, say something here? So I came to my current faculty job not knowing that I was six weeks pregnant. I found out like a, a week before I started the job, so not during the interview. And of course, that led a lot of anxiety of um, how will they take it? I can tell you that Pretty early on, uh, when my, our medical director can email us, sorry, I need, I won't be able to make that meeting because I have to take uh, my child to X, Y, or Z. It kind of normalized the fact that people have families, people have other obligations, and maternity leave is something that you should and are able to get. So I wouldn't feel uncomfortable asking about it because you want to have kids and your family at the end of the day is probably the most important thing to you. I just want to mention a quick tip is, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And one thing is, you know, I, for all my job interview, I always ask to speak to an HR specialist. So they will probably be the one can tell you all the policy and benefit and stuff like that. Because again, a lot of faculty probably didn't even know you want to ask me in my current institution, all the HR, like the benefit policy, including maternal leave. and benefit, I might not be able to answer you in detail. So I think it's also a good way that just, as I say, I'm very interested in the job. Can I talk to HR specialty learning some of the details of this institution? And just to amplify what Dr. Katz Greenberg said, you know, I think it's important because in an ideal world, even if a, if a policy exists, you don't ever want to be made to feel not quite right for taking the lead that is that 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 you deserve, that that is mandated for you. But you can also get a sense of the culture of the program with some of those other questions. Like when you ask the junior faculty, how much administrative support you get? When you ask the fellows and peace coordinators, do you feel the faculties are responsive? If you get good responses to those questions, that suggests that the culture of the institution is supportive and likely supportive in many different ways. So HR will give you the policy, but those questions will give you a sense of how supportive you'll feel with the policies. Can I um, bring up a sort of a related um, topic, which is one thing to ask for uh, or ask about is, um, especially for women who um, have babies during when they're faculty, is what is the, is the uh, promotion pathway? Um, how is that uh, taken into account for having children and having taking time off? Because more and more, which is really good, there are institutions that are accounting for that in your faculty promotion timeline. And um, I think that's something to really think about. If they don't have a policy for that, um, that could be something to consider because um, it can delay promotion um, uh, if you're taking time off to have children. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping more and more institutions are, are going towards the direction of accounting for that. So it's something I think to to ask for because you know you you have to sort of think that the place that you're taking a job may be your the place that you're going to be um, for the rest of your career. I've I've been at Northwestern 18 years, so 
Um, just something to, to think about, especially for, for the women. Thank you all for your great answers there. We have a few more questions. We will do our best to get to all of them. Um, let's start with this one. Um, can one of the panelists comment on the importance or lack thereof for cover letters? And if these should be standard or individualized for each in, for each job? I could um, help answer that. Um, I um, probably could have included cover letter and CV kind of together in, in my presentation. Um, I do think a cover letter is very helpful. Um, I think it doesn't have to be long a few paragraphs of just sort of summarizing who you are, essentially what, um, what you're looking for, kind of a, a clinical pathway, educator or physician scientist, what your main interests are. Um, it doesn't have to get into a lot of detail, but I think um, a, you know, just expressing interest, um, it's good to have you know, an initial cover letter, a little bit like a mini personal statement without all the, you know, I went into this because I saw that patient during residency <laughs> type stuff you have with personal statements, but sort of maybe like the second half of your, of a personal statement of your, um, when you applied for fellowship and something a little more mature, but I would advise, I would advise it. I think it'd be a good idea and, and run it by your mentors at your institutions before you send it out. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to combine these last two into one just so we have about five minutes left. Um, so first question is, how do you navigate exploring job opportunities outside of your home institution without putting off people at your home institution? And the second is about offer letters. When you get one, how long can you wait and how, can you ask for more time? I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, Again, I think it comes down to I don't think your home institution will be surprised that you're looking elsewhere. And if they are surprised or insulted, then that's sort of a red flag anyway. Uh, but if you're worried about it, I think you can couch it in for X, Y, and Z reason, families, blame it on your spouse. It's always good to blame things on your spouse. You know, you can just say, I need to look at elsewhere, other places. And I think that excuse is always it kind of smooths any potentially ruffled feathers. Um, so I, I don't I think, but as I think Dr. Levitsky said very nicely in his CV presentation, be honest. I mean, try to keep everything above board. You don't, you don't hide things from, from people, but you give good reasons so people are as less unhappy as possible. So I would uh, absolutely agree with it. And I think uh, I mentioned it also, don't burn bridges. Your, your, uh, where you're training now is your kind of home. So it's always good to keep them on your good side. And like Dr. Kittleson say, if they don't want you to go anywhere else, it's, it's a red flag for that institution um, if uh, they don't let you um, have wings and fly. Um, about the, cover, the offer letter, so usually there's uh, they they give you a time for when you were supposed to give back the cover letter the offer letter with a signature. Um, you can and you're able to tell them that you need an extension for X Y Z and Z. Again, going back to what Dr. Kilson say, always good to blame the spouse and say, I I really am interested, but my spouse has not found a good job yet, or we're not able to confirm his X, Y, or Z. So can I have another week or two? When it comes to that, they usually want you as much as you want them. And usually places will be understanding of that situation. Yeah, I, I echo that. And I do have to, because my skills and others also a physician. So, you know, when we look for a job, you know, we, we've been through a situation like that. And then uh, I do have to mention that you, sometimes if you mention, especially if you're to others also in, um, in the healthcare field, if you really like you, they'll find a job for he or she as well. And that's that's exactly what happened to us. So, you know, that's also a, 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 a stuff that you can mention when you're interested. Well, thank you so much everyone for your questions and to our panelists. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian for the final closing on our webinar today. Thank you so much. We would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's excellent session.